And in the strangest way, it might be the moment that people are actually ready to listen. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Who wants it? All right, who says climate isn't fun? Thanks for coming. It's great to see everyone here. I'm Greg Dalton and I'm host of Climate One and I'm here to welcome and honor Ben Santer and, and um, give him this, this prestigious award. Um, we're here. Um, we're going to talk with also Cassie Siegel with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ohlone and other indigenous people who've been stewarding these lands for 10,000 years. And there's many different tribes in the Bay Area who are working to restore their culture, heal from their historic trauma, and protect their traditional territory. I've got to know some Coast Miwok near where my wife and I and family live in Marin, and have learned a lot, and I encourage you to go beyond land acknowledgement and get to know indigenous people in your community. They are still here. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can get the podcast wherever you listen. You can subscribe right now if you're not already a subscriber. Uh, I get to sit up here in the bright lights and talk to fabulous people like Ben and Cassie, but it really takes a team. I'd like to acknowledge and give a shout out to the Climate One and Commonwealth Club teams. Adam, Dan, Alex, Megan, Billy, Brad, Jenny, Wensi, and Ben. Let's give them a round of applause right off the bat for them. Um, We record up here about once a month uh, tonight, and tomorrow we're going to be here to, talking about how to put scientists together with community leaders to address local climate risks. A lot of people are like, oh, how high do we build that seawall? What do we do? Going to learn about that tomorrow from three experts in town for AGU. Uh, Angela Chalk is executive director of the Healthy Community Services. Daniel Wildcat is a professor at the Haskell Indian Nations University. And Natasha Udagama is director of Thriving Earth Exchange at AGU. That's noon here tomorrow. At the end of tonight's conversation, we'll take questions from the audience. There's cards on or near your seat. Please write your name legibly in a brief question. And uh, we'll collect those and we'll have a... Um, uh, invite you, I'll call out some names, invite you to go to a, a microphone I think is going to be in this aisle over here. You can read your question in the order called. Um, now it's my great pleasure to welcome the renowned atmospheric scientist, Ben Santer. Ben is winner of this year's Stephen Schneider Award. He's also MacArthur Genius, Fowler Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the Woods Oceanographic Institution and Visiting Researcher at UCLA. Please welcome a climate rock star, Ben Santer. <laughs> Ben, so good to see you. Um, let's begin. In 1995, you're in Madrid at a meeting of the IPCC. This is just a couple of years after their first Rio summit. And set the scene. Who's there? What's at stake? What's going on in Madrid in 95? November 27th to 29th, Madrid. IPCC plenary meeting. The goal of the meeting is for the 99 governments of the world to approve the summary for policymakers that scientists have been working on for one and a half years and to accept the underlying report on which that summary is based. The first IPCC assessment in 1990 had essentially said the jury's out. We can't tell whether humans are affecting global climate. But in Madrid, the story was different, fundamentally different. And the bottom line finding was these infamous 12 words, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. It was the first time that the international scientific community spoke with one voice and said, we see it. We can formally identify a human caused global warming signal. It's us, it's us humans. It's us, and that was a big deal. 
There were countries present in Madrid, like the Saudis and Kuwaitis, who did not like that finding. They recognized, at a time really when scientists did not, that this was some sea change. It, it meant that at least there was the possibility that they would have to change the way they do business. And one of the people in the room in Madrid was your friend and my friend, Steve Schneider. Steve was the convening lead author, uh, one of the lead authors for the final chapter of that IPCC report called Advancing Our Understanding. That was the chapter that tried to chart the way forward. What are the important things to focus on scientifically? And Steve understood better than anyone else in the room the importance of those 12 words. And you went out to dinner with him afterwards. So you, you know, this, this plenary, there's sort of huge rooms, everybody's there, high stakes. It's kind of the Super Bowl <laughs> of science. And you went out to dinner with him afterwards and you had written these 12 famous words. And what did he say to you about those words, that sentence? Well, it was Madrid. We had been on stage for seven or eight hours, nothing to eat. We were exhausted. Those 12 words were the culmination of this long, arduous, difficult process to arrive at consensus, which we did. And just to jump in, so people who haven't been there, these are literally screens with text on the, you know, big rooms with people literally haggling over commas and, and, and words, right? Hundreds of people arguing over one word, which is kind of what's happening in, in Dubai right now also as we speak, so. That's exactly right. Um, there was simultaneous translation, so the discussions on stage were being translated into Chinese, Russian, Japanese, and much of the final discussion in Madrid was about the nuances of language. How does a word like discernible translate into Japanese or Chinese? You does, gotta squint to see it. <laughs> does it have the same meaning? Mm -hmm. Who knew? As a scientist, nothing in your career prepares you for having these kind of discussions about the nuance and power of language. But we did, we arrive at these 12 words, we go out to dinner, I just want a beer, I'm hungry. And Steve Schneider was sitting next to me at the restaurant, this is about 2 a.m. on the morning of the 30th of November, and he turns to me in the way that he often did in conferences and said, this will change the world, this sentence. I had no idea what he meant. And it changed your life. How did it change your life? Because after that, uh, Fred Seitz wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal. I think it's fair to say that those 12 words upset a lot of people. Powerful companies, organizations like the Global Climate Coalition, a consortium of energy interests, powerful congressmen like Dana Rohrabacher. They understood that this was fundamentally different in 1995 from 1990 and the jury is out. That wasn't threatening. This was threatening to corporate interests. So how do you attack the science? You take down the scientists. You go after the process. You argue that the process was political, not scientific. You argue, as the Global Climate Coalition did, that there was scientific cleansing, as they called it. This 1995, at the time that et ethnic cleansing is going on in Bosnia, so that all uncertainties had been purged from the report, it was a nasty game. And then they actually came at you, and there's this was one thing to write an article in the Wall Street Journal. It's another thing to come to your house. How did this opposition come to your doorstep? It's fair to say, as you did, that my life changed with those 12 words. I would be inextricably linked to them for the rest of my life. Nothing I could do or say would separate me from those 12 words and a lot of people didn't like them. And some people didn't like them sufficiently to actually come to my doorstep. This happened when my son Nick and I were in our house in San Ramon, knock on the door about 10 o'clock at night. I go downstairs to answer the door. There's a dead rat on the doorstep 
and a guy driving away at high speed in a yellow Hummer shouting curses at me. The police told me to be on the lookout for yellow Hummers, which I have done diligently ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> and you also, when you went, approached your car, you had some thoughts about... Yeah, I was afraid. There were people writing threatening letters, sending threatening emails. I had no idea what they were capable of doing. In my opinion, that was the beginning of organized climate denial and organized harassment of climate scientists. If you come up with findings we don't like and you have the temerity to publish them and speak publicly about them, we will come down on you like a ton of bricks. And it scared your son, too. It did. It was terrible. As a parent, you want to protect your kids. That's your prime directive, right, to keep them from harm. And the sense that my son Nick did not feel safe in our house after this dead rat on the doorstep incident made me so angry. And anger is toxic. You've got to figure out some way of dissipating that. And I think I did in the end. But the bottom line is this isn't a game. <laughs> when you send someone threatening emails or letters or write op-eds in papers like the Wall Street Journal attacking them, uh, there are consequences. And we see those consequences still today, unfortunately. And Nick, at that, your son at that point was, I think, quite young, and he slept with a wooden sword, right? Yeah, he had a little wooden sword, I still have it uh, <laughs> at home, that he put next to the side of, of mm. the bed. Mm. Again, because he didn't feel safe uh, in, in our house. And no one can take that away. No one can remove uh, that sense of not feeling safe in your own house. Did you consider quitting science? In 1996, I did, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, my life was falling apart. My marriage had fallen apart. And I wondered whether it was worth it continuing with science. Uh, Steve, at that vulnerable moment in my personal and professional history, encouraged me to stick with it. I remember vividly what he told me, that the attacks that I was experiencing meant that the work my colleagues and I were doing really mattered to others. And that in science, you often measure yourself not by the number and quality of papers you accumulate over time that you publish, but by the number and the power of the enemies you accumulate over time. It was sort of welcome to the club, Ben, <laughs> because at that time in 1996, Steve, who had spoken so powerfully and clearly about the reality and seriousness of climate change, one of the first bellwether voices had experienced uh, his fair share of uh, public attacks. Fearless, yeah. Unfortunately, many climate scientists have experienced that. I think you perhaps more than, than most. You also got harassed with freedom of information um, requests. Tell us about that. So the, the harassment kind of moved from rats on the doorstep to other types of harassment. Well, freedom of Information Act requests, open record requests, are a legitimate tool for shedding light on complex issues, um, enhancing transparency in government. But they can also be abused for illegitimate purposes. And in the early 2000s, that's exactly what happened to many climate scientists, not only here in the United States, but also in the UK, where uh, bad actors, folks who were not interested in improving understanding of the science, overwhelmed universities and individual researchers and research institutes with specious open records requests to eat up their time, to throw a spanner in the works, 
to prevent them from doing their jobs. That still continues to this day, unfortunately, which is one of the reasons that I do not wish to have any federal funding. Because if I receive federal funding, then I am subject to those requests. Right, Ken Cuccinelli in Virginia, there's a number of Michael Mann, a number of scientists have had this to try to, you know, yeah, I don't know, silence, harass, chew up your time. You have to lawyer up, right? And if you work for a national lab, like, you know, who represents you? Is that the, the lab's job? Or do you have to hire your own lawyer? And there's actually a nonprofit out there that raises money to, to legally defend scientists, right? I think the challenge is, Greg, how do you want to spend your time? Do you want to spend your time doing science? That's what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for spending days, weeks, months dealing with a succession of specious Freedom of Information Act requests. That's not how I want to spend my time. And you spent decades at a national lab, um, and you are, you know, kind of Mr. Fingerprint. You've kind of pioneered this area of, of attribution science. Um, why don't you tell us what is a human fingerprint, and how do we know? Because that science has evolved quite a bit. I stood on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so one of those giants was Klaus Hasselmann, who back in 1979 wrote the first paper outlining an elegant mathematical approach for doing fingerprinting, for separating, if you will, a human-caused global warming signal from the background noise of natural climate variability. Think things like El Niños, La Niñas, the rich natural fluctuations in climate on monthly, interannual, decadal, and longer timescales. You hear that all the time, you know, like, oh, climate's always changing. It's always has, always will. Eh. Right, and it does, and will in the future, and has in the past. But what we're doing by burning fossil fuels and increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other potent greenhouse gases is we're increasing the ability of the atmosphere to trap heat and thereby warming the surface of the planet and the oceans. We're changing everything. We fingerprinted pretty much every aspect of the climate system and human fingerprints are everywhere. Hasselmann's key insight back in 79 was look at patterns. If you move beyond one number, the average temperature of the planet, global mean temperature, and look at the complexity of geographical patterns of climate change, or slices through the atmosphere, right from the stratosphere over 20 um, kilometers above the surface down to the depths of the ocean, then you have a better chance in that pattern analysis of separating human fingerprints from natural climate variability. And that's what I've done together with brilliant women and men all around the world, many of them here in this audience tonight, is we've tried to fingerprint the climate system. And it used to be, you would hear on the news all the time, well, no single event can be linked to climate change. You have to look at patterns over time. Uh, I remember when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, Bloomberg, Business Week, this it's climate change, stupid. You know, where are we now? Can, you, can we today say this storm, this drought, this flood is climate change? So in some cases, we can say that this particular event, like the off-the-charts warming in the Pacific Northwest a few years ago, mm -hmm. would have been impossible without climate change. 106 in Portland. It was so far off the charts, so far outside of any instrumental records, it couldn't have happened without human-caused warming of the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere and the oceans. So what you speak to is this area of research called event attribution, where after the 2003 European summer heat wave, catastrophic event, excess mortality of roughly 70,000 people, warming of nearly two degrees Celsius relative to normal temperatures, catastrophic event. And scientists in the UK ran a climate model with human effects on climate and without human effects on climate in order to assess how human-caused warming 
had changed the likelihood of something like the European summer heat wave. And that is now being done routinely. It's being done by one of my colleagues here in the audience, Michael Weiner, uh, in very innovative and sophisticated ways. The bottom line from pretty much all of this research is we're changing the odds. So Steve Schneider's analogy was loading the die. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're changing the dice so that uh, it's more likely to get longer lasting, more extreme, extreme events. Think droughts, floods, heat waves, and that's bad. We're playing a game that's not a game and we're loading the die in favor of bad outcomes. From 2016 to 2020, a lot of things happened. Wildfires really took off in the American West. Storms that I can't even remember happened. They kind of blur and roll into another. Um, that was a tough time for you working at a national lab uh, in a very, in a political climate, hostile to your work. Tell us about that period. It was a difficult four-year period. Um, I love my job. I was working together with some of the best and the brightest. Again, many of them here in the audience this evening. Such a joy to spend decades of my life together with them trying to evaluate climate models, trying to fingerprint the climate system, trying to understand how this beautiful and complex world in which we live is changing and why it's changing. But the Trump administration was no big fan of this kind of work. And they did not want us to do this kind of work or to speak about it, or to speak about it in terms of fingerprinting. Uh, Folks wanted these euphemisms. And to me, there's no point being a scientist if you're unwilling to speak publicly about the technical work that you do, if you're unwilling to defend it when it comes under unjustified political attack. And I'm proud of the fact that we did. We didn't just roll over and say, this powerful individual, the President of the United States, is incorrectly dismissing everything we're doing as a hoax and a conspiracy. It's not. And we all lose if we let that narrative of hoax and conspiracy um, prevail. We can't allow that to happen. So we continue doing this critically important work, and I'm proud to say that it continues at Livermore today. We need evidence. <laughs> which I think we'll be talking about in a few minutes. The courts need evidence, and scientists need to provide the best scientific information on the nature and causes of climate change. But that work is going on at Livermore National Laboratory in the San Francisco Bay Area without you. You chose to leave. Tell, tell us about your departure from that lab. You, you left, why? My departure was unfortunate. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Um, one member of the Board of Governors, a very eminent physicist, Professor Stephen Koonin, had been invited to give a lecture at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. This will have been in May 2021. And Professor Koonin, not a climate scientist, but an eminent physicist, had just written a book entitled Unsettled, where the premise in the book was that climate science is unsettled, that despite all the fingerprinting and event attribution, we don't need to do anything about it. We need to study for another 20, 30 years and see how things turn out. The fact that Livermore was willing to give Professor Koonin a lecture to speak about um, his book and the fact that Professor Koonin was resistant to the idea of actually interacting with Livermore scientists and learning about fingerprinting or learning more about climate models and climate model evaluation, that was terrible. Um, how could something like that be happening at a national lab? I did not understand. So 
I decided that I would speak out publicly, and I did. And that was a very, very difficult personal decision for me. I recognized that in the act of speaking out publicly, I would be burning bridges. Uh, but again, there are times when you have to choose, when there's a fork in the road, <laughs> and those choices may be tremendously difficult. Be brave when you reach that fork in the road and you have to choose. And I'm proud that I chose to defend the work that we had done for three decades at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And so were you fired? Did they make it uncomfortable? Did you just decide, like, this is, I'm out? I decided that I was out. Uh, I was not fired. Let me be very clear on that. I had hoped to continue to have some sort of uh, status at Livermore uh, as a researcher who had spent 30 years there. But after this incident, I decided that I did not want that anymore and that the only way that the institution could change was if it experienced a hard consequence, if uh, it recognized that this is, the, this is not the way you treat your climate scientists, particularly your younger scientists, to show them this form of disrespect. Yeah, we care about the work that you do, but um, this guy's powerful and can do a lot of good for us, and uh, even if he's using this lecture as a platform for casting doubt on the reality and seriousness of climate change, he's important to us. No, I think you have to choose, particularly of your national lab, science. So you took the... Um... So you left, and the work goes on. You left, took your principal stand. You're now working at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You're an atmospheric scientist, not an oceans person. <laughs> what are you doing there? How did they let you in? And, um, <laughs> and um, what are you learning? Well, uh, Woods Hole has kindly given me a two months per year gig. And it turns out that you can teach an old dog new tricks. So I have spent most of my professional life in the atmosphere, doing fingerprinting with temperature in the atmosphere, with moisture, with many different things. But I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to the ocean. This was an opportunity to do fingerprinting in the ocean, to learn from some of the best and the brightest. The folks at Woods Hole make a ton of interesting and innovative measurements of ocean temperature and salinity and what's happening under Antarctic ice shelves and they build robotic systems that go to the depths of the ocean that now look at not only temperature and salinity but ocean chemistry as well. My job is to try and interact with those folks who make the measurements and to use them for fingerprinting, for understanding how and why the oceans are changing. It's wonderful. And the oceans have really saved us. There's the mind boggling. I mean, the oceans are absorbing a huge amount of carbon. And if, if they weren't doing that, it would be insanely more hot, right? Yeah, the oceans have been uh, absorbing much of the heat, uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the heat that we have generated by mm -hmm. burning fossil fuels and increasing levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So it seems critically important to understand how the oceans are changing, particularly at depth, where we have so few measurements. Um, much of the ocean is um, tabula rasa, and the folks at Woods Hole and many other oceanographic institutions around the world are trying to fill in the gaps and help us understand how the oceans are changing. So it's wonderful at this late stage in my life to be mentoring young students, to be thinking about the oceans, and to recognize that my expertise still has value to others. Do you feel more free not working for a national lab? Can you like well, be more edgy with your words, with your, can you, I mean, because working for a national lab, there's certain constraints. Do you feel liberated? 
I was always pretty edgy, I would say. <laughs> but I was very mindful of my colleagues. You know, I was for some period of time until my colleague Celine Bonfi, uh, who's here in the audience tonight, took over. I was the leader of the Climate Change Detection and Attribution Group at Lawrence Livermore. And these were my colleagues in that group and my friends. And I didn't want to do anything that might negatively impact them, their funding, their families. So it was very difficult being in that position where you're charged with trying to uh, secure funding for a group. But at the same time as you're charged with doing that, the very work you're doing is coming under unjustified political attack. What do you do? Do you just zip it and say nothing? Or do you continue to try and do the best research you possibly can while also speaking publicly about the importance of doing that work? That's what I chose to do. And there's quite a debate now about scientists, whether they ought to stick, stay in their lane, or you know, some scientists get political and start making policy prescriptions. Um, Rose Abramoff was fired from a, from a national lab for protesting. Uh, what do you think is the, you know, we are in this urgent crisis, what is the appropriate role of a scientist, and where are, where are the lines? Well, that's a great question, and I think that it is critically important to delimit the boundaries of your expertise, which I always try and do. I'm a physical climate scientist. I spent my entire career trying to understand the climate system, how we're changing it by increasing greenhouse gases, but also how it changes naturally through volcanoes and intrinsic variability and all that nice stuff. But at the same time, like Steve Schneider, I'm a citizen of this planet. And I care a lot, as you do, about the kind of world we are bequeathing to our kids and our grandkids and many, many future generations. It's intensely frustrating to me to see this disconnect between our mature scientific understanding of the reality and seriousness of climate change and political inaction, which we're witnessing on a daily basis in, in Dubai. So I do think it's important for scientists to get out of their comfort zone sometimes and, and speak not only uh, as experts, but say I'm speaking as a human being, as, as a father, uh, as, as, as a wife, um, as someone who cares about this. These are my values. And I want you to understand that when I'm speaking about my values, I'm speaking from the heart as a human being. So I try and do that in all of my public lectures now. I, I talk about fingerprinting. I talk about evidence. I talk about the importance of evidence. But I also talk about being a human being and human values and the imperative of trying to fix things before it's, it's too late. And there. I am now increasingly willing to get into um, policy issues and willing to say what I, what I feel uh, as a non-expert on these issues, but from my interaction with real experts, um, I think carbon pricing, some form of carbon pricing, uh, is the way to go in addressing this problem. And what, another area like that, um, Lawrence Livermore, uh, National Labs been in the news recently for nuclear fusion. Um, some people think that that's the holy grail. Uh, that's not your area of expertise, but you were inside that institution. Um, are you excited about the prospect of fusion? That, that experiment was, they created net positive energy for a fraction of a second. Many institutions, not just Livermore, are uh, pursuing fusion research variety of different forms, Livermore's with lasers, others with very powerful uh, magnets. Let's hope that some of these things pan out, but betting on that, betting that one of them will go from essentially a, a demonstration to sustained practical fusion energy 
in a time frame where it can really make a difference to us, I'm skeptical about that personally. Uh, I think we need to do the things we can do already as, as um, powerfully and at scale uh, without waiting f for some magic bullet that may or may not be on the horizon. Let's do what we can now um, and get our act together. Rather than some techno fix to down the horizon, right? It means we don't have to change our ways. So much of what you do, so much of what you and other climate scientists have been predicting for decades have come true faster than predicted and expected with devastating impacts around the world, devastating human impacts. What's it like? Do you ever feel like, ah, I told you so? No, I, I feel sadness. There's great intellectual satisfaction in doing this kind of work. It's a detective story, a whodunit, and... You never, they don't ever think, if you would just listen to us, I've, I've really loved improving, in a small way, our understanding of the nature and causes of climate change. But as some of the, these predictions have come to pass, there's sadness, there's no joy in seeing something that someone predicted 55 years ago, the warming of the troposphere and the cooling of the upper atmosphere as we ramp up uh, levels of greenhouse gases. Uh, we've shown that, others have shown that now, as clearly as you possibly can. 1950, Edward Teller, your former colleague at Livermore, told the American Petroleum Institute at Columbia University, you've got a problem. Yeah, we've, we've known about the problem of human intervention in the climate system for a long time. And the evidence has gotten stronger and clearer every year almost which brings us to 2021 and the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. And this famous word, unequivocal, it is unequivocal that human fingerprints are everywhere in the climate system, in the oceans, in the land, in the atmosphere. We can't deny that reality anymore. It's all around us. And yet political action and ambition is out of sync with that mature scientific understanding. That's the frustration. Yeah, it's, it's nice to do this work, but there's no joy in seeing predictions come true. There's no, I told you so. Before we ask Cassie to come up, you're now spending some time educating judges about climate science. Tell us about that work. You're kind of taking judges to climate school. Well, uh, a few years ago, the National Academy of Sciences and the Federal Judicial Council had a meeting, and the meeting was geared towards updating a reference manual on scientific evidence. And one component of this meeting was to educate judges about climate science and the latest, greatest developments in, say, climate fingerprinting or satellite uh, data or the kind of event attribution stuff that you and I talked about, things like the European summer heat wave and how human-caused warming is changing the properties of extreme events. So I've interacted with the court system uh, for about the last two years or so, uh, with federal judges, with judges here in California, with judges in Korea, uh, as part of a bilateral US-Korean uh, meeting. And it's important. I, I think the courts need to understand best practices for introducing this complex scientific evidence in a court of law. But there are also forces of unreason out there who don't want this to happen. They don't want scientists to educate judges. And that's where many of these specious open records requests have been coming from recently, from folks who don't want scientists communicating with the court. 
Now I'd like to invite Cassie Siegel to join us uh, to talk about how the climate and science and the courts come together. She is Senior Counsel and Director of the Climate Law Institute at the Center for Biological Diversity. Please welcome Cassie Siegel. <laughs> Cassie, there's, uh, California filed a big case against the world's largest, uh, five of the world's largest oil companies and the American Petroleum, Inst Petroleum Institute. You think it's an elegant case. Uh, California has been sitting on the sidelines for quite a while, finally jumped in, uh, arguing that emissions caused the problem and the companies lied about it. Tell us about that case. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible, powerful case that California filed back in September, just as the UN Climate Ambition Summit was getting underway in New York. California filed um, the latest in what's called the climate accountability litigation. And in the, these cases are very powerful tools for holding fossil fuel companies accountable for the damage that they've caused and the lies that they've told. And in California's case, like the other climate damages cases, um, the plaintiffs are arguing that the oil companies knew about the climate science, they lied about the climate science, and therefore they should be held accountable. So um, it's, it's, it's really, um, I, I really think it's a pivotal moment, the, the filing of California's case. And, and also, I just want to say, like, um, there would be no climate law without climate science. And um, Dr. Santer's work is, is particularly pivotal in this case. Like, the, the causal chain and the argument that they're making in this case is that fossil fuel production and the combustion of the fossil fuels led to the carbon dioxide emissions that led to massive climate damages. And therefore, the companies that produce the fossil fuels, that profited from the fossil fuels, should pay for the damage. And so that's the scientific underpinning. And then there is the second part, which is the lying. And what's so fascinating is that in the California complaint, the 1995 attacks on Dr. Santer, those false attacks are actually mentioned in the complaint. And so the complaint, it's the legal filing um, that starts the case. It tells, um, you know, lays out the elements of the case. It doesn't give every detail. So if something's mentioned in the complaint, it's usually a pretty big deal. It hasn't gone to trial, of course. None, none of these types of cases have, but um, I think it's quite likely um, that at trial, that would be a key piece of evidence, and it would be poetic justice on an epic scale <laughs> if those <laughs> false attacks on Dr. Santer become um, one of the pieces of evidence that is the basis of liability and then the payment um, of billions of dollars in damages by these companies for the damage they caused and the lies that they told. So to, to re just yeah capture that so it's like because the companies say look we make this oil you put it in your car you burn it it goes up in the sky it goes all over the world you can't connect this refinery with this eroded uh, ocean or this this climate impact right but Ben Santer's work comes in and says oh yes you can you can link this burning to this damage in this place in this time Ben what was it like to Note that you know the companies that were attacking you for lying now are you know citing you. You're, you're cited in these court cases. What's it like to be? It's chilling to see some of this stuff come out. We were discussing backstage this paper that was published earlier this year that showed that Exxon's own climate scientists, 40 years ago or more, were making projections of carbon dioxide increase with fossil fuel burning, global warming with that carbon dioxide increase. And their own internal corporate projections were every bit as skillful as the projections of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Exxon got it right. They knew, they predicted accurately what was going to happen. They got it right not just qualitatively, but quantitatively. And at the same time, Exxon, in its own internal documents and briefings to directors, was saying, yeah, this detection stuff, 
it's right. The, the counter narratives that all warming is natural and due to the sun or internal fluctuations in climate, they're not credible. And it was that that was so shocking to me, that disconnect between that internal corporate understanding in 1995 and going after the IPCC and um, folks like me. That, I would hope, gets them into some trouble. That was misleading their shareholders. It was misleading the public. And I hope they are held accountable for that. So let's take a specific example, say Chevron refinery in Richmond, for example. Um, you know, one of the largest greenhouse gas emissions uh, polluters in the state of California. How can you say like, well, we don't know. How can you say how much of the sand, you know, of the coast erodes because of, of that one facility? How much can you say that the wildfires that have ravaged the American West or California are because of that one facility? They, that's their defense is like, we can't know. It's a global problem and it crosses borders. You can't pin this on this one facility or this one company. Well, people have for some years now done what's called source attribution, where you know from the internal accounting how much individual companies emit. And that is the basis for trying to figure out some share of damages. In the last couple of years, we can go better than that. We don't have to rely on a company's reported emissions uh, and do the accounting. We can measure it from space, as Al Gore showed in uh, COP28 in Dubai, we now have satellite measurements that enable us to look at the emissions from individual sources and individual countries. That ultimately is the basis for treaty verification and for making sure that uh, companies and countries are accurately reporting their emissions. So going forward, it's gonna be tough to evade responsibility <laughs> for the emissions that you make as a corporate actor. Right, so Cassie, how, how's that gonna affect, because that's been a, you know, one of the key links missing in, in litigation is like, well, you can't, we don't, can't really pin this much on us, and, you know, so how's that gonna affect the cases, you think? Well, that's, a, that's another um, key piece of the science. So as Dr. Santer um, alluded to, the source attribution, there's a database called the Carbon Majors Database that Rick Heedy and the Climate Accountability Institute have been working on for many years, and it takes um, all of the uh, fossil fuel production as reported by the companies themselves, the world's largest investor-owned and uh, state-owned fossil fuel companies, based on their own reporting of their production since the Industrial Revolution. And they show that a relatively small number of companies is responsible for a big chunk of emissions. So about the top 100 companies responsible for about two-thirds of the world emis um, emissions, just the top 20 companies responsible for about one-third. So those are the companies that you tend to, be, tend to see uh, showing up as the defense in this climate accountability um, litigation, and then you add on another area of research where you say, okay, based on those emissions, how much are the companies responsible for in terms of uh, air temperature warming, ocean warming, ocean acidification, and so forth. And again, you, uh, they show that small number of companies, about 90 companies, for example, responsible for about half of um, uh, surface temperature warming. So it's how the science just keeps building on itself, right? So, but you know, without that, without that IPCC second assessment report in 1995, none of the rest of this um, would have been possible. Keep right. Advancing. Right. Um, and Cassie, there's some cases that places to watch in the courts as climate comes into the courts. Um, you say the Hawaiian Supreme Court has strong knowledge of climate science and is one state to watch. What's happening in Hawaii that we should know and care about? Yeah, so in Hawaii, the Supreme Court has issued a couple of really remarkable opinions recently showing that the court really understands the science, really understands the climate crisis. One was in, actually, they were considering an agency's denial of a biomass power plant. And um, the agency denied it. They said, we actually see through your greenwashing. This is actually not good for the climate. And the court understood that. And they also found that under Hawaii's constitution, there is a right 
to a safe and livable climate. Mm -hmm. And this is a big deal. There's a constitutional case brought by youth moving forward in Hawaii, and I think it's also a very good sign for the climate damages cases that have been brought by Honolulu and Maui against the fossil fuel polluters for the damage. So very, very interesting um, things uh, to look for there. Also, Montana, similar case, you know, big win there with Held versus Montana. Again, youth saying there's a, a winning uh, a judgment there that there's a constitutional right to a safe environment in, in Montana, though that seems like that's probably going to be overturned by a su conservative uh, Supreme Court in Montana. You just never know. Maybe you I just should. never know what's going to happen next until it happens. But there have been some... Um, really encouraging advances. And I mean, that's one overall point is like, there would be no climate law without climate science. So um, my work in these cases would not be possible without um, Dr. Sanders' work and all the other scientists. So it's just a really um, wonderful opportunity and an honor to be able to say thank you to Dr. Santer personally. Um, you know, it's the, you know the, the science, it's hard and it's dangerous and it's really obvious how it's physically dangerous if you're like out there on the Greenland ice sheet, but in many ways I think it's more dangerous when the fossil fuel industry goes after you. So um, it's just really um, nice to be able to say thank you on my behalf and lots of other lawyers and activists who admire and um, depend on your work for hours. Thank you. <laughs> the work is the reward. And there's this narrative out there that all this bad stuff has happened to you and dead rats on the doorstep and congressional investigation and funding cuts. But no, I've had the extraordinary privilege to work on issues that really matter to you and to other people together with brilliant women and men all around the world. That's not victimhood, that's extraordinary privilege. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm grateful for is that I can continue doing it in some small way today. Yeah. Ben, you've said that climate science uh, today is where DNA was 30 years ago and uh, with respect to the courts. Uh, we now, DNA finds you know, convicts is used to convict criminals and release innocent people, people innocently incarcerated, wrongfully incarcerated. So say more about how that and how you would explain climate fingerprinting to a judge or jury. 25, 30 years ago, DNA evidence was novel and it was complex, it was technical. How do you explain this information to Judges, How do you give them best practices for considering such evidence in a court of law? To me, that's what my colleagues and I can do with fingerprinting and with event attribution and with satellite temperature data that has been the subject of much political discussion. We can provide information about how it's done, uh, what the uncertainties are in this kind of work, what we need to pay attention to uh, and what the likely interventions are. What, what are people going to criticize if this is introduced in a court of law? It's, it's important to educate the courts in advance to tell them about evidence and how that evidence has evolved over time. I see that as a critically important function of scientists, not to say, here, read this paper <laughs> or these dozens of papers or this IPCC report. No, that's not good enough. You have to be able to be accountable, to talk about the evidence, its limitations, its strengths in front of the people who will be judging that evidence. And Kathy, is there, on the other side, do, or do judges, what access does industry have to wine and dine and play golf with <laughs> judges? <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they have a lot of influence and they're really blatant about it. And one of the things that, um, you know, is so enraging is that they just, <laughs> they just um, you know, the nerve 
to um, be, you know, pushing the envelope beyond what we can even imagine on their side, and then going after um, in in such a vicious way um, attempts to really um, educate judges and and advance science and and the public interest. So Clarence Thomas is yeah. not the only one. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yes, Public so. opinion around climate change has shifted dramatically since uh, 95 and Ben's 12 words. But, you know, the courts, science moves slowly, climate moves quickly, courts move slowly. There are about some, what, some three dozen cases or so moving through the courts right now. Cassie, how do you think we're going to start to see these decisions? And what are some of the clusters of types of cases that, that are out there? It's hard for me, and I do this, do this for a living, to keep track of all the different cases. Some are kind of product liability. Some are, some are lying. Some are uh, damages, nuisances. Yeah, so we have um, three dozen cases in what um, is the uh, climate accountability um, line of cases. And there are um, climate damages components of those cases, and that is based on the polluter pays principle. So that's like baked into our legal system that um, the polluter who caused the pollution, who profited from it, should, should pay, not the public. And then we have um, consumer protect, uh, protection claims um, in there where that's based on um, uh, laws which uh, prohibit false and deceptive advertising and seek to hold the companies accountable when they're lying um, about their fossil fuels. There's another type of claim which is products liability, which may sound familiar, um, and that is when you um, manufacture a product which is dangerous when used as intended, and you fail to warn the public about that danger, you can then be held liable for that. And in the fossil fuel example, not only did they fail to warn, they actually actively misled. Um, and then there's another um, line of cases under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act, or RICO, where you can be held liable when you conspire to do something that's illegal or fraudulent. And um, dozens of local governments in Puerto Rico have filed um, a RICO case against the fossil fuel companies for, um, you know, it's based around the horribly damaging 2017 hurricane season and the damage that Puerto Rico experienced there. Hoboken, New Jersey has filed a RICO case. And this is just in the climate accountability arena, right? <laughs> the, the type of law that I do is actually mostly um, uh, based on enforcing the flagship environmental laws passed by Congress, so the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, which are actually very well suited to addressing greenhouse pollution just like other environmental problems. There's constitutional claims, there's many more, and that's just in U.S. law. <laughs> How concerned are you about this, this Supreme Court rolling a lot of this back? Yeah, so I am very concerned about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has lost its integrity. It, it needs to be fixed. It can be fixed. Um, Congress can add seats. They can put in um, uh, term limits. They can put in a conflict of ethics policy. So it is a huge problem. This Supreme Court is in the business of changing the law, right, for results-oriented um, outcomes, but I don't. But but that said, we we need to address that. But we also we can't let that prevent us from going to the judicial branch because it is a huge um, part of our government. It's a huge part of the um, solution. And even this Supreme Court is not going to be able to intervene in every single case. We still win a lot, even with um, you know the terribly unbalanced judiciary and shift to the hard right um, that, that we've seen over the course of my lifetime. We're going to go to your questions. I'd like to invite Paul, Keith, and Andy to come up to the microphone, which I think is going to be here, if I can see. Uh, Paul, Keith, and Andy, welcome to uh, come up and present your question. If we have, do we have only one Paul? I'm good. Welcome. Keith. Okith. Okay. Hi, Ben Keith Yamamoto. Good to see you. Um, 
and, uh, and thanks for your work. Congratulations on this award. And thanks very much for all that you've done over the years in speaking out to the public. Um, so I'm, I'm a scientist, as you know, and, and uh, put a lot of time into those, that kind of communication as well with the public. With Has that changed anything about the way that you do your messaging? And what kind of advice would you give to scientists who, who um, understand the responsibility but are concerned about doing so in, in this political climate? Thank you, Keith, and thank you for all the work that you do in trying to restore trust to science. I would say that as a scientist, immunologist, epidemiologist, climate scientist, whatever kind of scientist you are, you have a responsibility to speak science to power, to always bring people back to evidence, to facts, to likely outcomes, if we do nothing to develop vaccines, to um, institute countermeasures, uh, same in, in climate science, the worst thing we could do would be to be silent, to allow these powerful forces of unreason, even if those forces are at the level of the President of the United States, to cow you into submission, to make you fearful of speaking publicly. So there's a continuing, maybe even increasing imperative to talk about what we do and write about what we do. Find any vehicle we have, op-eds, blogs, uh, public lectures, you name it. Find what you're good at and communicate about the science that you're passionate about as often as you possibly can. Plus, Restoring trust to science requires ensuring that there are protections for government-funded scientists, something that organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists and like AAAS and others are trying to do. Restoring trust science means doing things like the National Center for Science Education does, explaining how science works. How do, how do people actually do it? Uh, what's the power and beauty in science? So there's no one answer to your question, Keith. There are many, many different ways, I think, of trying to restore trust to science, but it requires all of us in the room <laughs> to do that, not just scientists. Let's have, um, we have Keith and Andy, I think. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Andy. Andy, hi Andy. Ben, congratulations from me and from all of the rest of your colleagues on the Union of Scientists Board of Directors, we're lucky to have your counsel at our meetings. The question that I want to ask you is a question about courage, um, something you have a lot of. Um, I see that there's a great need for courage in public communications now, especially among elected officials. Can you describe how you have found the courage that you have shown and what you can suggest to those who need to find theirs. Thank you, Andy. And it's a privilege to serve with you on the board of directors of the Union of Concerned Scientists and with others here uh, in the room from UCS. To me, courage is non-negotiable. <laughs> it doesn't depend on the political administration in power. Courage comes from what you do. Why become a scientist? You become a scientist, I think, because you're curious about the strange and beautiful world in which we live. You're passionate about it. You want to share that passion with others. And the notion that some administration would prevent you from doing that, that you'd be too fearful to speak about what you love doing. No, that's just not acceptable. We all have a voice. Uh, we all have a voice scientifically if we do research and we all have a voice in terms of our values, what kind of world we want to live in and leave behind for future generations. To me, you know, I'm a climber. Uh, I spent a lot of my life in situations with some of my friends here in the room, climbing where if something goes wrong, there are bad outcomes. You deal with fear, you deal with overcoming fear. And 
I'm not afraid of losing my job. I'm not afraid of speaking out. That's one thing that climbing and mountaineering taught me, to be brave, not to be afraid. <laughs> I don't want to live my life in fear, and I don't think that many of the people in this room want to live their life in fear either. So you'll take the Republican conference out on the mountaineering expedition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I would like to take them to the Juneau ice field in Alaska. So I'm, I've been privileged to go to the Juneau ice field to do research, to chronicle the melting of glaciers, how that melting has affected sea level rise, and if you could only take people to those places and show them the visual and visceral reality of on-the-ground climate change, I feel that would make a difference uh, for folks to see how rapidly this world is changing. So yeah, I, I can think of many people I'd like to take to Greenland, where Greg went to, and to the Juneau ice field, and to places where they could witness they could be witnesses. Keith, welcome. Actually, Paul, I think oh. we got around the other way. So <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm an Australian and I'm a, I'm a colleague of Ben's for 10 years. So I, I just wanted to congratulate you, Ben. You've, you've really been an inspiration. Uh, I think everyone here from work and extended colleagues around the world, um, you've really carried, you've, you've lit the torch and then carried the torch. Um, and I've been very lucky, I think, to have you as a colleague and a friend. Um, and I, I've asked you many questions before, but not this one. So I've saved it for last. <laughs> so if you could meet yourself, your, your 25 year old self today, um, and provide words of inspiration and advice, what would those words be? Well, thank you, Paul. And again, the work that uh, I've been fortunate enough to do and the work that Cassie, you said such kind things about, was done in collaboration with you and with many others around the world. That's been one of the joys of my life. So this isn't a single scientist coming up with those 12 words. This is with an entire scientific community uh, reaching this understanding. And, and that's, that's been and remains one of the joys of my life. If I were 25-year-old Ben, um, I would tell myself, to spend a little bit more time smelling the roses, going climbing with some of my friends in the audience here, uh, not just um, working on the next paper and on the next report, but taking the, taking the time deliberately to get out there and do stuff I love, not saying that's gonna have to take a back seat. That's what I would tell myself, to back off a little sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, each year, Climate One grants the Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. This recognition comes with a $20,000 award, and we give it to a natural or social scientist who's made extraordinary scientific contributions and communicated that knowledge to a broad public in a compelling fashion. Steve Schneider was unique in both he was an amazing scientist and a communicator. We honor people like Dr. Santer, who you know, follow and, and uphold those kinds of dual ideals. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, why I created the award, and then we're going to present the award to Ben. I went to the Arctic in 2007 on a global warming symposium with scientists and journalists, had a life-changing epiphany, came back and cried and put together a slideshow. One of the first things I did is I went to Stanford and, and had the privilege of kind of talking with Steve Schneider. He, he laid it out for me, and I was like, wow, I really want to do something about this, and created Climate One. He became the first uh, member of the Climate One Advisory Council. I was this you know, Climate One, no one knew what it was back then, this little thing at the Commonwealth Club, and was honored when 2009, when Steve wrote his last book, Science as a Contact Sport. He came to Climate One here at the Commonwealth Club, presented that, you know, the first day of his book tour, um, Science as a Contact Sport. He, uh, at the end of the book, you'll remember, he said, what can you do? Well, it's kind of like that old Crosby, Stills, and Nash song, you know, teach your children, you can teach your children. 
had the honor of one time of going with Steve's wife, uh, Terry Root. I think Larry Goulder was there. Uh, we saw Graham Nash perform, and it became kind of our theme song for a while, <laughs> Teach Your Children Well. It's, there's a great video on YouTube of uh, some children singing that song to Graham Nash, first time it ever happened. And when Steve died um, in 2010, he wrote to me and said, um, I really want to come to Climate One, but I'm flying back from Europe, and I've been not well, and I've been burning the candle uh, at both ends in the middle, too. But he said he was going to fly into SFO from Europe, come up to San Francisco, where I was interviewing Joe Rome, uh, climate progress blogger, and we got word that Steve died on that flight. And it was pretty rough, and it just really hit me really hard. And I remember that we turned in kind of a remembrance of like what, you know, we, um, and I wasn't um, his student. I didn't know him that well. But out of that, I created this award with the blessing of Larry Goulder and Ben and people who knew him well. And we've had the, presented it to some fabulous uh, scholars and scientists over the years. And that's the background of the award and why we do it. Um, and, been privileged to do that for more than 10 years now. I'd like to uh, now present, uh, invite up here to present the, the award, uh, Christine Russell, who's a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Environment and Natural Resources Program. She's on the jury, and she's also an award-winning journalist in her own right and past president of the National Association of Science Writers. Please welcome Christine Russell. Well, it really is, on behalf of Climate One, my very, very great pleasure to present the 2023 Stephen H. Snyder Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication to Atmospheric Scientist Ben Santer. Uh, we've heard today, um, I've learned a lot about him uh, in addition to the facts that are all over the internet. Uh, but Dr. Sander really, uh, in getting this award, pioneered the research efforts showing that humans were the major causes of global climate change. And as we heard, he was the lead author on that path-breaking paper in 1995, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And he continued this path breaking research throughout his career to identify other human fingerprints on the climate system, including atmospheric temperature and water vapor, ocean heat content, sea surface temperature in hurricane formation regions, and many other climate variables. But most importantly, in terms of this award, Dr. Sander has taken all of that knowledge and spoken publicly and frequently about the human causes of climate change in order to help influence the ongoing debate about climate policy. Uh, I think it was very emotional for me to hear him talking. Uh, at, earlier today, we were on a Zoom call and also during our session about his personal relationship with Steve Snyder. I've been on the jury for 10 years, and many people knew Steve Schneider, but I think this personal contact and the fact that Steve really did have a huge impact on your staying in science, thanks heaven, and, and speaking out about uh, climate change and its impact. And I have to say on a personal note, uh, as a Washington Post journalist, I got to know Steve very, very well. He was one of the most articulate, and journalists are, are prone to look for people who can speak as uh, Dr. Santer has this evening um, in ways that the public can understand. Uh, he retired in 2021 after 30 years at Lawrence Livermore National Lab but I think we've again heard that 
I don't like the word retire because it sounds like he's as busy as he can be, uh, both doing research and speaking out uh, and being an active scientist, as we've heard. He's also a MacArthur Genius Fellow, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Geological Union, a recipient of the Proctor Prize. But again, on this public side, he has reached out to public audiences, including Scientific American blogs, serving on the board of the National Center for Science Education, and even, I didn't know this till today, even making a late night television appearance on the Seth Meyers show. <laughs> so he is definitely, as Greg said, a rock star scientist. Um, I think he was the first climate scientist to be on the Seth Meyers show. <laughs> and uh, uh, that would be worth going back and uh, it's probably taped and, and seeing exactly what you had to say. So on behalf of all of us in this room, congratulations to Dr. Ben Santer on this very, very special occasion where he joins an illustrious group of Snyder Award winners. And again, it's just been a privilege to talk about you, listen to you, and earlier serve on the jury with you. And thank you for all that you have done on behalf of all of us in this audience and the bigger global world. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So I'm not sure what this crystal ball is going to tell us, <laughs> but Ben Santer is going to tell us something about the future. Thank you, Chris, for your incredibly kind words. Thank you to the other members of the jury for considering me worthy of this award. And thanks, Greg, for instituting this and commemorating Steve in this wonderful way. And thanks, Cassie, for being on stage and talking <laughs> about judges and evidence and the court and uh, the way forward. Thank you to everyone in the audience. I have many friends, I have many colleagues, I have family here in the audience. And that makes this all the more special to me that I can share this unexpected moment because it was <laughs> unexpected for me with so many people I really care about and who care about me. A few words about Steve Schneider. Uh, Greg has already told a couple of stories about our interactions together, but here's one he didn't tell. So when things were really bad in 1996 after the IPCC report, Steve and his wife, Terry, were incredibly kind to me and to my son, Nick. They invited us over to their house in Palo Alto, together with Bill Anderegg, Lee Anderegg, Larry Goulder, uh, who are in the audience tonight. And Steve would bring out his 12-string guitar, and we would jam. Steve had a big, uh, loose-leaf folder of all kinds of songs that he had collected over the years. And that ability to just be with friends and make music and be joyful was wonderful. It was another thing that helped me to continue doing science. So Steve was my friend. I believe you have to honor your friends. I would encourage you, those who did not know Steve personally or have not read his books or his scientific papers, to learn a little bit more about him. If he touched your life, you didn't forget it. He touched Greg's life, he touched your life, he touched my life. Um, part of the wonderful aspect of the, this award here is that it keeps Steve's memory alive and fresh. Keep fresh flowers in the vase all the time. And I hope, uh, getting back to what Greg said earlier, that this award 
can be made financially secure for many, many future recipients. So thank you very much to everyone who came here tonight, and um, thank you to Steve. And as we wrap up, I'd just like to say we do, uh, this is a $20,000 a year award. We fund it out of our operating. We do have a couple of donors, Mike Haas in particular, who support it. Uh, we do want to secure its future. We have a, a, a donor who stepped forward today with a $50,000 grant uh, to seed sort of a, a basis or a foundation for this award going forward so we can secure its future because uh, Ben and I are not going to be around forever. The, you know, we want to really give a permanent foundation under it. So if you'd like to learn about that, to contribute to the award, to honor people like Ben Santer, who are, you've heard his touching story today, courageous speaking science to power. I like that phrase. Um, please talk to me or one of the Climate One staff and maybe some of you will be following up and chasing you down because um, we would like to uh, leverage that, that $50,000 matching gift between now and next June. If we raise $400,000, that generates enough income to fund the award securely over time so we can honor the Ben Santers of tomorrow and the future who are doing this important, powerful work on behalf of all of us. Thank you for coming. Please join us in the reception outside. Afterwards, we can toast to Ben and each other. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank really you emotional. <laughs> you know, I, I just knew Steve 